Welcome to Capital Link's Trending News Podcast Series. In this podcast series, we discuss with company management on recent news and announcements they have made. I am Nicholas Bornois, President of Capital Link, and I'm delighted that today we have with us Mr. Hamish Norton, President of uh, Starbuck Carriers. Our discussion will touch upon the company's Q2 2023 recently announced results, but will mainly focus on Starbucks' uh, recent key developments, strategy, and the dry bulk sector outlook. Now, a quick uh, reminder of our disclaimer that our podcasts are provided purely for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind, and Capital Link uh, bears no responsibility for them. Starbuck, uh, for, uh, to remind you, is a global shipping company providing worldwide seaborne transportation in the dry bulk sector. Its common shares trade on NASDAQ under the symbol SBLK, and with a fleet of 120 vessels adjusted for the five vessels recently sold, Starbuck is one of the largest dry bulk shipping companies in the world. Capital Link is the Investor Relations Advisor to Starbuck. And now I will uh, welcome Hamish, and uh, we will uh, start our discussion. Hamish, let me start with uh, the Q1 2023 market and company uh, conditions. L uh, your results, which were announced on uh, August 4, uh, despite the softer dry bulk market, Starbuck reported a profitable second quarter with an adjusted net income of 48 and a half million. You declared another quarterly dividend of 40 cents per share, and you continued with uh, your share buyback, focusing on shareholder returns. That is a key part of your strategy. So can you share with us what you consider to have been the key elements on the market conditions on one hand and Starbucks, uh, Starbucks performance on the other? Uh, thanks, Nicholas. So, yeah, I mean, the the, the first uh, the first half of 2023, uh, and particularly Q2, was a bit disappointing. Um, you know, what what basically seems to have been going on was that you know, despite weakness in China's economy, China was actually importing a, a basically as much uh, dry bulk commodity uh, as we expected. Uh, they imported a lot of iron ore. They imported double the amount of coal from last year. Uh, they imported a significant amount of grain. The, the the weakness in demand was actually outside of China, where where uh, you know shipments were were down a few percent. Um, but it seems like the major influence on charter rates was actually an effective increase in supply of ships. Um, now, there, there were only, uh, I think, uh, net net about 1.6% of the fleet uh, net of scrapping was delivered in the first half of 2023, but um, port congestion um, declined, uh, ba basically ships waiting to get into port um, and effectively increased the supply of ships by about 5% which which was enough to um you know produce the market that we saw in q2 uh which was you know in, indeed not not as good as we were anticipating but uh you know we keep keep our costs very low uh we reported recurring opex of four thousand seven hundred seventy two dollars per ship per day and uh cash gna of a thousand fifty one per ship per day which is you know just about the lowest of of any of our peers, and uh, we're remaining in the top rank of uh, right ship ratings among our peers, which, which is you know a measure of the safety of of the ship. So um, you know we're we're uh, we're pretty happy how that turned out. Thank you. I mean, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the sector outlook uh, in a lot more detail uh, further uh, on in our uh, discussion, but let me now turn to fleet renewal. Mm -hmm. uh, during the first half of uh, 2023, you have sold uh, a total of seven vessels. Five of those uh, were sold in uh, the second quarter. So fleet renewal is on everybody's agenda. What are your plans overall in this uh, area? Do you have any fleet expansion plans? Do you consider new builds? Or, uh, you know, you've been acquiring in the past... Uh, ships for sales is that still a possibility 
So, so first of all, let me let me talk a little bit of, about the sales. You know, what we saw um, was a disconnect in our minds, anyway, between um, the charter rates available today on certain ships, and frankly, our, our expectation of the charter rates that were going to be available in the future to these ships. You know, the the ships we sold were not among the most fuel efficient in our fleet. And uh, yeah, our view is that fuel efficiency uh, is going to become more and more important over time. And um, you know, when, when we have a market that is pricing ships based upon short-term income um, and ignoring long-term implications of, of fuel inefficiency, we're going to take advantage of those situations, and you know, fr frankly, in, in in the in the situation that existed when we sold these ships, uh, it wasn't even near-term income; it was anticipation of future income that was driving the prices of the ships. So, you know, we uh, we uh, are very happy with those sales, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, we calculated that uh, the rate of return on the ships, the Supermax ship, ships we sold, the five Supermaxes, um, was 42% per year since uh, the, the date we acquired them, I believe, in 2018 or 19. Um, so, um, you know... Fleet renewal has two components. Um, disposing of the older, less fuel efficient ships in as efficient a way as possible, which we've started, which we will continue. And then um, replacing those ships with younger, uh, more fuel efficient ships. And, um, you know, the, there are a few ways we could do that. Um, Certainly merging with companies that have younger and more fuel efficient ships is something we're always looking at and which which may may well happen. Um, and, you know, we we obviously uh, have a track record of being able to do that. Uh, I wouldn't rule out. You know, ordering new buildings at some point when we have a very attractive investment available to us. Uh, obviously, we are always paying attention to alternative investments like buying back our shares. And, you know, if, if our share price is very low, that's going to influence us as to whether we buy back shares or invest in new buildings. Uh, so I think people shouldn't worry about that. We're, we're always um, making the right calculations from a shareholder's point of view. Um, but you know, we suspect there may be some interesting new building possibilities in the, you know, not incredibly distant future. Um, you know, we, we, we see uh, that the makers of ammonia compatible engines are making more progress than, uh, than I think they expected or the, the, than we expected. Um, so look, it could be, it could be, uh, you know, secondhand vessels could be new builds, you know, could be ships for shares, effectively mergers, or it could be that we, you know, buy back stock. You know, in any case, the, the new buildings uh, are always an option, but I think given uh, the uh, the shipyard capacity, uh, anyone who is placing uh, uh, a new build order today would have to wait for some time before getting delivery, so... Yes, I mean, we're, this isn't something that we're looking at as we speak. So that uh, drives me to the next question. Uh, you mentioned uh, very correctly about fuel efficiency and, and fleet upgrades. So what initiatives have you implemented? You have a very large fleet. So how are you upgrading the existing fleet uh, to meet those uh, standards? Well, we're, we're acting reasonably aggressively um, to increase the fuel efficiency of the fleet. Um, you know, first of all, we're 
trialing a number of different paint formulations. Um, and, you know, it, paint turns out to be a very important part of fuel efficiency. Um, you know, I think uh, people may not be aware that probably the single most important thing you can do to keep your fleet as fuel efficient as possible is to keep the hull as clean as possible. It is very easy for a fouled hull to cause the ship to consume 20% or more fuel in addition to what the ship should consume. So it's it's very important. So we're looking at paints, we're looking at uh, hull cleaning robots that would keep the hull free of fouling on a continuous basis. Uh, we're looking at ultrasonic anti-fouling devices that would prevent fouling from accumulating in the first place. Um, on essentially all of our ships that don't have these devices already, we're installing energy saving devices, which are basically ducts and vanes that are welded to the hull just ahead of the propeller that give the water sort of a, a twist in the opposite direction of the propeller so that as the water passes through, through the veins and then the propeller, it comes out with ideally no twist. And so all the energy is devoted to pushing the ship forward. Uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, but not installing yet, you know, wind assisted uh, ship propulsion. Um, and, you know, the thing we're, we're doing today with, with all of our ships is we're installing precision vessel performance monitoring equipment that um, sends that information back to our head office in real time and allows us to do a precision measurement of the performance of the ship on an ongoing basis and to use the precision measurement of the performance of the ship to optimize our routes and speeds taking into account the weather uh you know the wind waves currents um you know so when you combine all of that you can make a very big difference in your uh in your fuel efficiency um you know easily over 20 percent james th thank you for this uh detail uh and and especially because when we talk about decarbonization everybody's thinking that um you know once we decide which is the winning fuel then we're going to have brand new ships burning that fuel but until then which who knows when it will happen it's a process that you win day by day by installing all these uh, there are so many ways that uh, you can improve the efficiency. And the point is you have a fleet in the water, so you have to do something with the fleet today. And obviously with everything you're describing, uh, you, you're doing a lot of initiatives there. And there are so many ways that you can, uh, I mean, the, the figure that you mentioned about uh, the reduction of emissions uh, with all these uh, initiatives is quite uh, staggering, I would say. Yeah, I agree. So let me now move uh, to the next question, um, carbon capture. Again, there are so many ways to reduce uh, mm -hmm. emissions. One of them that seems to be uh, you know, getting a lot more uh, people uh, implementing it is carbon capture. You, uh, you mentioned that during your recent call that uh, you successfully completed the onboard testing of carbon capture technology with the capabilities to retain up to 30% of uh, CO2 emissions. So how significant is this development and how can it be implemented fleet-wide? Well, yeah, I, it may be very significant. Um, you know, assuming that we get a carbon tax uh, or that, um, you know, uh, the ships, for example, that serve the European Union are a sort of separately carved out fleet. But but basically in any situation where emission of carbon itself creates a cost above and beyond the cost of the fuel, you know, carbon capture can be a part of of you know meeting the 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 goals of uh, basically reducing our costs. Um, and it, it seemed to work uh, quite well. You know, we we basically uh, captured carbon from our exhaust, um, compressed it, liquefied it, and stored it in a tank. 
and uh, it appears to be practical um, even for ships that are going uh, from Brazil to China, um, you know, where you would have pretty large tanks to store all the, the resulting carbon dioxide. Um, as long as you have a way to offload the CO2 in an environmentally friendly way, it, presumably, uh, you know, the best use for that CO2 would be to be injected into the ground and, and stored indefinitely. Um, you know, it's, it's going to cost money, you know, unlike, for example, um, uh, you know, hull cleaning robots, there's not a payback on carbon capture unless there's some sort of carbon tax or, um, you know, emissions trading scheme. But if you have such a tax or an emissions trading scheme, yeah, the, the payback looks like it might be um, effective. It might, it, these, these, uh, this sort of equipment, we may see it on many ships in the near future. Amos, can I ask you something that I find a bit puzzling? Mm -hmm. now, what are the IMO uh, carbon reduction targets? 30, 40% over by 2030? Yeah, and and it's of course net zero by 2050. So, if if carbon capture can reduce emissions by 30 percent, does it mean we could potentially achieve IMO reduction targets this year? Well, if everybody implements it. You know, the the the, the carbon capture technology is expensive. Um, you know, it, it's uh, five to ten million dollars for the equipment on board ship, and then there's operating costs, which are not insignificant. Um, so, if you put a tax on CO two, um, you know, if you put a tax on CO two of you know two or three hundred dollars a ton, this technology would probably be financially attractive today but of course if you put a tax on co2 emissions of two or three hundred dollars a ton the cost of shipping would go up dramatically and the impact on the world economy might be dramatic as well um so you know one has to keep the whole picture in mind of course Okay, so let me then move to uh, capital allocation. That is a, a particularly significant uh, topic for uh, for Starbuck, uh, and your shareholders. You have a strong balance sheet with pro forma cash of four hundred and fifty seven million as of August first, net debt of seven hundred twenty five million, against uh, a fleet scrap value of eight hundred million. So, quite uh, a strong balance sheet. What can investors expect in terms of your dividend and share buyback programs? Let me mention here that um, following the recent vessel sales, you have a net cash balance of 140 million, which, as you mentioned during the conference call, will not be used for dividends, but instead will be used for general corporate purposes, including fleet renewal, debt repayment, and share buyback. So, what is your capital allocation thoughts going forward? Well, you know, I think investors should be expecting us to do pretty much what we've been doing all along. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see a, a major change in our policies uh, in any of these aspects. We will continue to follow our dividend policy, um, which is basically to pay out the cash from operations as a dividend. Um, and uh, you know that that is going to be uh, protected. Um, and as we have said in the past, when we can sell ships and buy back stock in a way that is, you know, sort of a clear arbitrage, um, you know, we we may well do that. And you know, we did some of that. Uh, during the past quarter, uh, and and we are likely to continue doing that. Um, you know, I think the the one thing that uh, is a little new 
is that we are getting um, some hints that we may have some very interesting investment opportunities. Um, and so, um, you know, we will, that's a, that's a third element that will be considered in terms of, of use of not operating cash, but certainly the cash that we receive from sales of the ships. Um, and, and debt repayments, again, we're going to continue in, a, you know, with our normal practice of um, paying amortization on our bank debt before paying dividend. And uh, the amortization uh, for 2023, I believe we, we said was $177 million, $177 million. So, you know, investors can anticipate net debt dropping. I think it's very interesting that uh, in your case, you have a particularly precise mechanism for calculating the dividend distribution, which means that uh, if we go through this process, then we know what uh, is the, the amount left uh, for other uh, potential uh, actions. Uh, in terms of your capital allocation, yeah, yeah, and in, in, and in particular, if you know, if investors can can forecast, um, you know, our future performance, which of course is very hard, <laughs> uh, they will be able to calculate our dividend um, because you know there's there's not a lot of discretion that goes into to, into our calculation of the dividend. Exactly. Anyway, let's let's move now to the uh, the sector outlook that is uh, particularly interesting. You mentioned in your Q2 presentation that net fleet growth is unlikely to exceed two percent in 2024 yeah. and 2025, against expected demand growth of 2.4 percent in ton miles for uh, 2024. Now, if that is realized, should it translate into a robust market? Uh, and let's start with the supply side. What are the main catalysts that you expect uh, on the supply side? Well, you know, I think the supply side for 2024 and 2025 is basically locked in. Um, you know, th there's just about no way you could order a ship, a dry bulk ship for delivery before 2026 at this point. Um Certainly, in it, any shipyard you'd want to have build the ship. So, you know, the the total order book is seven point seven percent, which is a little bit up from the all time low, but it's a lot. It, you know, the all time low was in the six percent range, so it's close to the all time low. Um, and you know that is. Uh, that 7.7% includes second half of 2023, 2024, 2025, and, you know, substantial numbers of ships in 2026 and 27. So, um, you know, um, we, we think gross fleet growth will be a little over 2%. And, you know, we are anticipating some scrapping. Um, you know, the, the, there are, I believe, 20% of the fleet or thereabouts over the age of 15, 8% over the age of 20. Um, and I may have these figures off by a, a few tenths of a percent, but uh, the, the, that's close. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of relatively fuel inefficient ships. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of ships that were built between 2008 and 2012 um, that were ordered at the height of the, uh, the peaky uh, dry bulk market in 2007, 2008. And at that time, the earliest delivery of a new building you could get was at a shipyard that did not at that time exist. So the shipyard had to be built and then the shipyard had to build the ships. And in many cases, these shipyards were built and they built the ships. And the ships that were built at these yards typically are very, very inefficient users of fuel. Um, and, you know, we think those ships will have a relatively hard time uh, with the uh, CII uh, carbon intensity indicator 
uh, rules uh, starting next year. And, um, you know, uh, the, the question is, will, will an E-rated ship, you know, be able to have a commercial existence or is it going to be more efficient to scrap that ship? And, uh, you know, we, we think a number of these ships will get scrapped. Very, very interesting. Now, on the same path, uh, on the supply side, slow steaming is, is a factor. I think we yeah. have seen uh, slow steaming already in place. Uh, we have these environmental regulations coming uh, on board. We have also the uh, European, uh, the EU ETS. Do you expect that to have a bigger impact on uh, slow steaming and thus fleet supply? Well, you know, um, if you're subject to the EU ETS, um, carbon emissions really cost. You know, it, it's um, it's not just saving fuel; uh, it's saving carbon. Um, now, you know, since fuel and carbon are basically um, you know proportional to each other, it's it's as if the price of fuel went up. Um, and, you know, when the price of fuel goes up at a given charter rate, the profit maximizing speed for the vessel is, is lower. So, you know, you would expect the fleet to slow down. Now, it's a very complicated situation because, first of all, the fleet is right now about as slow as it's ever been. It's 10.95 knots. Um, now, it can go slower. Um, you know, a modern ship can go six, seven knots. Um, but um, we haven't seen the whole fleet, frankly, go m much, if, if any, slower than, than 10.95 knots. What, what the EU ETS will do, though, probably is keep the fleet from speeding up at the very least. Um, now, the complication is that the fellow who pays the EU ETS is going to be the fellow who's incentivized to slow the ship down. Um, it's still a little fuzzy how a ship owner is going to force the charterer to pay for the EU ETS uh, yeah, credits. Amazing. Um, you know, th that's certainly the EU's intention is that the charterer, who is the one, uh, you know, responsible for the commercial itinerary uh, of the ship and the speed of the ship, you know, that entity should pay the, the, uh, for the credits. Um, but, you know, at the moment, it, it looks like we'll have to make sure that that's in our charter contracts. And you know collection mechanisms and so on. You know TBD. Um, well, the regulation stipulates that, so it's a good starting point. It, yes, they they stipulate it, but they don't say what you're how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it it, it is a, it is a bit complicated. Um, anyway, maybe we can move on to the uh, demand side, yeah. and. Um, Whereas on I think on the supply side things are a bit more clear. How do you see things on the demand side? And uh, China has always been a locomotive for the dry bar trade. Um, mm -hmm. I think China has been softening, coming back uh, again. Um, we have all this uh, situation with the Ukraine and uh, yeah. the grain food security now is yeah. added to energy security. So yeah, well you know. Um... China's economy obviously is is weaker than people were hoping or expecting, but um, their uh, their importation of dry bulk, as I mentioned, has been actually quite strong. You know, they've been importing a lot of iron ore. They've been importing twice as much coal as last year. Yeah, you know, which is and China's importation of coal is really the small difference between the extremely large amount of coal they consume and the almost equally large quantity of coal they produce. Um, you know, it's, it's on the order of 5 billion tons of consumption and production, and the importation is just the, the difference between 
those roughly 5 billion ton quantities. So it's easy for coal imports in China to double, and, and that's what they've done. And, and grain uh, imports are up. Um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the Ukraine uh, war has clearly reduced the supply of grain that's able to be shipped. And, you know, a, a lot of that grain, frankly, was headed straight for China uh, before it got locked, blocked in. Um, but, uh, you know, we anticipate that, you know, other grain producers such as Brazil will be able to fill in the gap. And, um, you know, we, we think that the, the ton miles will, will continue to go up, um, you know, faster than the fleet growth. Um, and, you know, one thing we've noticed is that, you know, Chinese steel production is, despite their weak, weak, weaker than expected economy, is actually up substantially. Um, and st steel production in the rest of the world is, is down uh, three to 4%. Um, that's not the worst thing in the world for dry bulk shipping. If, for example, if uh, you have countries that are closing down steel mills, perhaps due to concerns about carbon emissions, um, you know, if China, who has stated that their peak carbon emissions from steel production are not going to be in 2025 anymore, but they delayed that anticipated peak till 2030. So they're clearly expecting their steel production to rise. If China takes over um, that steel production and exports the steel, you know, not only do we get a longer trip carrying the iron ore from Brazil or, or e even Australia to China, um, but we get the, the ability to carry steel coils back from China to the rest of the world. So it, it could be good for dry bulk, in fact. And also India, I think, is coming up stronger. Yes, India, India is coming up stronger. And, you know, they, they are certainly importing a bunch of coal. Now, you know, India, of course, it's hard to predict because they have a lot of domestic coal. They have a lot of domestic um, iron ore. Um, you know, sometimes they have a hard time with domestic transportation. And so sometimes sea transportation is is uh, appealing to them. Um but you know, ba basically, dry bulk demand has been for a long time going up more or less as fast as the world economy. And you know, if the world economy grows at three percent and the supply of ships grows at two percent, it's a good year. Yeah, and I think everybody says that we are potentially close to uh, interest rate hikes uh, uh, stopping. Yes. So that should have an effect. A anyway. Let me uh, let me close with uh, something that uh, I find a little bit uh, puzzling, but very interesting. Now, I will take your comment that uh, from a stock market point of view, if, uh, at least, uh, the market is valuing companies based on short-term earnings. However, we see that uh, investors look at shipping one way, but then we see that ship owners look at shipping in a different way. I mean, following the public news, we see a number of uh, very well-known shipping names uh, wanting to increase their dry bulk exposure, either buying assets or buying into other uh, dry bulk listed companies. We also see that uh, even though freight rates have come down, asset prices, vessel values remain high. So what do we make out of this? Well, I think the ship owners understand something that the the uh, stock market is is not understanding to the same degree, and that is that there are you know th this this fraction of the dry bulk fleet that is a a real super consumer of fuel. It's about a third of the fleet, and if that third of the fleet becomes really commercially unattractive to use, um, that's going to create 
a an extremely high charter rate environment for the remaining two thirds of the fleet. So you know if 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 you can as a ship owner, take your ships and make them as fuel efficient as possible. And, you know, we, we don't own any of the sort of bottom third of the fleet. Uh, you know, this, this are, are relatively fuel inefficient ships that among typical, typical of the ones that we sold, for example, are still substantially more fuel efficient than the worst ships in the fleet. You get rid of those ships from the commercial market, charter rates are going to go very high. And you know that's not just true for the dry bulk market, but it is more true of the dry bulk market than of other shipping sectors, because the shipyards that were constructed on green fields in 2008, 2009, 2010, primarily were constructed to build dry bulk ships. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, these ship owners are looking at dry bulk having gone up in cost less than tankers, less than container ships, you know, less than LNG carriers, car carriers, you name it. So it looks like the most attractive investment within shipping. And it's got this particular benefit, which is that, uh, you know, the environmental rules will probably make a big chunk of the fleet unattractive. So that's going to be, we think, a support for charter rates for you know most of a decade. Very interesting. Well, that's a very nice way to close our uh, very interesting discussion as always. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Uh, any closing remarks? Uh, well, um, I guess, um, you know, I, I I wish you and all of our listeners a a wonderful remainder of the summer. Amy, thank you very very much uh, for this uh, very insightful discussion. I'm Nicholas Bornos of Capital Link, and we had the privilege to discuss with uh, Mr. Famous Norton, president of uh, Starbucks Carriers. Thank you very much, Famous. Thank you. Thank you.